it's time for another amazing chemistry video with Mr. Stapleton. Proudly sponsored by Farming Doing Nice Coffee. Hi guys, welcome to the next video. This one is going to be um, following on from the uh, previous video all about primary bonds. Today we're going to be looking at secondary bonds. So we're going to go through the three different types of secondary bonds. But just before that, I just want to quickly recap um, around um, polar and non-polar bonds. Okay. So the first thing I want to look at is a polar bond. Now if we're talking about a polar bond, we're talking about one that has a net direction of charge. So what do we mean by that? Well normally it means that you've got two different non-metal atoms. So when we're talking about secondary um, bonds, we're going to be talking about um, non-polar or polar covalent molecules. All right. So we're going to be talking about polar and non-polar bonds as well. So what we're looking at is two non-metal atoms, so I'm just going to choose something like hydrogen and chlorine, for example, just a bond between those two. Now, chlorine is more electronegative than hydrogen because it's closer to fluorine. So in the bond, that represents two electrons, the electrons are closer to the chlorine. So the chlorine has a slight partial negative charge, a delta negative, and the hydrogen is delta positive. We have a net direction of charge there, so we call this a polar bond. A nonpolar bond does not have a net direction of charge. Okay, so a nonpolar bond is generally between two identical, all right, two identical nonmetal atoms, and what they do is they share their electron density equally. So this time we'll just go chlorine to chlorine like this. Both the chlorines have 17 um, protons in their nucleus. The two electrons that are in the middle here are shared evenly, okay? So there's no net direction of charge, and that's what we call a nonpolar bond. <clears throat> now, that's in an ideal world that we have the electrons right in the middle. What we can have, though, occasionally in this is um, what we call induced dipoles. And I'm going to come back to that when we look at. Um, dipole, dipole and dispersion bonds because when we have a non-polar bond here we can actually get some slight partial positive and negative charges across the bond and that's important so I'll explain that a little bit later. So what I'm going to look at firstly okay, is a polar molecule all right, because we need to understand what a polar molecule is. So just like a polar bond has a net direction of charge, a polar molecule has a net direction of charge. So you work this out by looking at all the net direction of charge of the bonds within the molecule, and then you work out if the overall molecule has a net direction of charge. Okay. So what we're going to look at is just a um, simple molecule like phosphorus trichloride here, PCl3. So we've got three chlorines down the bottom, lone pair of electrons at the top. Now the chlorines are more electronegative than phosphorus because they're closer to fluorine. So they will attract more of the electron density to themselves in a bond. All right, the phosphorus is delta positive. So what we've got here, overall, if we kind of split the molecule down the middle, all right, up here we've got a positive charge, down here we've got a negative charge. So overall we have a net direction of charge within the molecule, so it's a polar molecule. Okay, I'll show you one more. So another one that has a net direction of charge is something like sulfur dioxide, this one here. Okay. So again, we've got a lone pair of electrons at the top here. So the oxygen is more electronegative, so it draws electron density to itself. Okay. Delta positive there. And again, easiest way to work it out is kind of put a line through the middle of your molecule. All right. If you've got all the positives on one side and the negatives on the other side, you've got a net direction of charge. So we have a polar molecule. Okay. Notice that for these ones, we've got um, polar bonds within here. Okay. Because we've got this negative to positive there. So that's a polar bond between the sulfur and the oxygen. And overall, this molecule is polar because the molecule has a net direction of charge. If you go the opposite way and you talk about a nonpolar molecule, all right, a nonpolar molecule has no net direction of charge. Okay. No net direction of charge is important. So it's important to note that you can have polar bonds within a nonpolar molecule. So I'm going to draw up here methane. Okay. Here we go. So here's our methane molecule. 
carbon this time is more electronegative because it's closer to fluorine. So within the carbon, if we look at just this bond here, that's a polar covalent bond there. We've got a direction of charge across that bond. However, if we put a line sort of through the middle here, okay, here we've got positive and a negative, here we've got some positives, all right? We don't have a net direction. Here down the, um, this direction of charge is going that way, positive to negative, and here it's going positive to negative that way. So it cancels out. This molecule overall has no net direction of charge, so it's nonpolar. Okay? Uh, you can have very, very simple nonpolar molecules as well, um, which are what we call diatomic molecules. And, we'll, and I want to show you one of these because it comes in more important uh, when we look at um, um, dispersion bonds. So I'm just going to look again back to that chlorine to chlorine bond. So if this is a chlorine molecule, okay, here we have have uh, pretty much equal sharing of electrons. We've got no charges here, so we've got no net direction of charge overall, so it's also a nonpolar molecule. Okay? So you need to kind of keep those in mind for when we start talking about three different types of secondary bonds that you can have. So the first one I'm going to be talking about is a hydrogen bond. Okay? Now, hydrogen bonds are really, really um, important because they um, are involved in uh, things like DNA. So giving you the, um, the shape of DNA, you get hydrogen bondings between the two strands, all right, which causes to have that double helix shape. Okay? It's important within water. Um, lots of other substances as well use hydrogen bonding, particularly within the body. Okay? So to understand the definition of hydrogen bonding, it's when you've got a hydrogen attached to an electronegative oxygen or, I should say, or nitrogen, okay? And then that bonds to another oxygen or nitrogen atom, okay? So what that means is, here's our oxygen, I'm just going to use oxygen the first time here, and we've got a hydrogen attached. Now that's a very, very polar bond because there's a large difference in electronegativity between the two of them. Okay? So we've got this um, polar bond over here. Okay? What we've got is the oxygen from another molecule of the same which has a delta negative charge. Okay? And that's just bonded off to something else. All right? Now, what happens is that the partial positive charge here is attracted to the partial negative charge here. So we have an electrostatic interaction. Now, this is not a full transfer of electrons or, or, or sharing of electrons like you normally find in a primary bond. These ones are just electrostatic interactions between partial positive and negative charges. They're not full bonds. So we represent that with just a dotted line, okay, to show it's not a full bond. But we've got this interaction between them, okay, and that is what we call a hydrogen bond. Okay, you could easily have a nitrogen here as well, it doesn't matter, but the key is you must have a hydrogen attached to an electronegative oxygen or nitrogen, and that is then bonded to another oxygen from the same type of molecule. Okay, or it can be another one if, if you need to be, um, such as you find in DNA. So I want to show you just very, very simply what that kind of looks like. Okay, so here we've got a couple of water molecules over here, and I'll just start with this one here. What we've got is a delta positive and delta negative here. On this molecule we've got delta positive and delta negative here. So what happens, these molecules of water, all right, if it was just in a liquid form, they're floating around and what they will do is that the negative of the oxygen here will be attracted to the positive of the hydrogen there. And so we get a hydrogen bond forming between the oxygen and the hydrogen. But we've obviously over here got another delta positive Okay, so what can happen is that another water molecule can come over here. All right, we've got delta negative over here on the water molecule, and we get a hydrogen bond forming between them. Okay, you could obviously then bring in another one over here, and this oxygen here with a delta negative charge will be attracted to that delta positive hydrogen there. Okay, and you get a hydrogen bond forming between those two. So you can see really quickly we can start to get lots and lots of hydrogen bonds forming. Now these are the strongest of the secondary bonds, okay? That means they require more energy to break than any of the others. Because you've got such a difference in your electronegativity between your oxygen and your hydrogen, you've got quite strong delta positive, delta negative charges. So you require a decent amount of energy to actually break that bond and then break the molecules apart, okay? Remember, you can also have 
um, a nitrogen atom instead of an oxygen if you want. Okay, so here if I just bring in some methane, uh, sorry, some ammonia, there's an ammonia molecule. Bring another one in, all right. The delta positive on that hydrogen is going to be attracted to the delta negative charge on the nitrogen, and we get a hydrogen bond forming between them. Okay, now the fact that these hydrogen bonds require a decent amount of energy to break is the reason that these are liquids at room temperature. Okay, so water has a boiling point of around 96, uh, ammonia is up around the 40 or 50 mark, I think, from memory. Okay, so um, they require more energy to break than the other secondary bonds, which I'm going to show. Alright, so if you remember that you have a hydrogen attached to an electronegative nitrogen or oxygen, and that bonds to another electronegative nitrogen or oxygen, that's how you get your hydrogen bond, and they are the strongest. Alright, I'm going to show you the second one now. So the second type of secondary bonds I'm going to be looking at are what we call dipole-dipole bonds. So this occurs when you have a polar covalent bond, which has a net direction of charge, and that partial positive or negative on one of the ends of that polar bond is attracted to another partial positive or negative on another molecule. All right. So I'll show you what I mean by that. Okay. If we look at a sulfur dioxide molecule, okay, what we have is a delta negative charge on the oxygen because it's more electronegative, delta positive on that sulfur. Okay, now that is going to be attracted to another sulfur dioxide molecule over here, which has a delta positive and a delta negative on it. Okay, so that electrostatic attraction forms another secondary bond here, but it's not a hydrogen bond this time, okay, because we don't have that electronegative oxygen nitrogen with a hydrogen attached. So these bonds are weaker than hydrogen bonds. Okay, and so this is the reason that sulfur dioxide is a gas at room temperature. We don't require as much energy to break this apart because this delta positive and delta negative aren't as um, strong as they were in the hydrogen bond. So it's less energy to break that and actually move the molecules apart. Now it's important to know that you can actually have hydrogens involved in dipole-dipole bonds. All right, so if we go back to phosphine that we had before, like this, we know phosphorus is more electronegative than hydrogen because it's closer to fluorine, so it attracts electron density more to itself in a bond. So we've got a polar phosphorus-hydrogen bond there. If we bring in another phosphine over here, okay, what we've got is a delta negative charge on that phosphine, delta positive there. So we get an interaction between the hydrogen and the phosphorus with the delta negative charge. However, it's not a hydrogen bond because we don't have that electronegative oxygen or nitrogen here. So these are weaker than hydrogen bonds, okay, which means that they require less energy to break, so the boiling points of these molecules are lower. And the third type of secondary bond that you can have is what we call a dispersion bond. Okay. Now a dispersion bond is also sometimes called an induced dipole. Okay. And the reason for that is because you can have, within a non-polar bond, you can actually have some delta positive, delta negative charges occurring. Okay. So if we go back to this chlorine here, and we've got another chlorine here, okay. both of these have 17 protons in them, these chlorine atoms. All right. And what you've got in the middle here is two electrons from this bond. Now at any one time, imagine this is a bit like a tug of war match, okay? So the 17 protons here are going to be trying to attract the electrons, and these 17 protons are going to be trying to attract the electrons. This one might slightly pull the electrons towards itself, just very ever so slightly. So these electrons just slightly move over towards this chlorine. As soon as it does that, what it does is it creates a partial negative charge on this chlorine and a partial positive charge on that chlorine. Okay. However, what's going to happen is that this one is then going to re-exert its strength as well, and it's going to pull these electrons back over towards this side. And now, what that does is that actually changes the polarity of the atoms. So all of a sudden, this one becomes delta negative, and this one's become delta positive. And so what you find happening across these bonds, these non-polar covalent bonds, is that your dipoles are constantly switching from one side to the other. So when you bring these molecules in together, that has a real impact upon how strongly they are attracted to each other. Okay? So if we start off by looking at a hydrogen attached to another hydrogen, okay, like this, 
they would have no attraction to each other. But what we do on this one is we actually bring in a slight delta positive, delta negative on that molecule. Okay, And then we have a slight delta negative, delta positive on this one as well. And they keep changing back and forth. So if this one over here is also delta positive, delta negative, okay, what we're going to get is a secondary bond, a dispersion bond formed between those two hydrogen atoms. However, what happens is that this one would then switch its polarity, so we would get delta negative, delta positive. All of a sudden, you've got two negatives opposite each other. They're going to repel, and that bond is going to be broken. So it requires really no energy at all to break these weak dispersion bonds. So these are the weakest of all the secondary bonds, right? and they require really small amounts of energy to break. So all of these molecules you'll find are also gases at room temperature. Now it doesn't just have to be diatomic molecules that have dispersion bonds. If we bring up methane like this, here's two methane molecules. Now what we've got here are polar bonds. We've got delta negative, delta positive. We've got delta negative, delta positive through here. Okay, But what we've got is obviously these negatives in the middle are surrounded by these positives, so it's really, really hard for these to form any sort of interaction. So you can have very, very weak, again, induced dipole bonds forming between them in very, very rare cases, okay? But these, again, very, very weak, so these are easily separated apart. That secondary bond is broken, which is why your um, organic molecules like methane, ethane, propane, they're all gases at room temperature because they're all held together by weak dispersion bonds. All right, so I hope this has been helpful. All right, three types of bonds. All right, you've got, for your secondary bonds, you've got hydrogen bonds, which are the strongest. You've got your dipole-dipole bonds, which is the next strongest, and you've got dispersion, which are your weakest. Make sure you can tell the difference between them. All of them relate to having partial positive or negative charges, but that does impact the boiling point. All right? The um, stronger the secondary bond, the more energy that it's required, the higher the boiling point of the molecule will be. Hope this helps. Recommend you go back and watch it a couple of times. Thanks, guys.